Well, the polls are open. No, 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 not not the Michigan polls. I mean, there are votes being cast in Jackson County for folks overseas in the military and others of that ilk who are trying to figure out whether or not to extend a three eight cent sales tax for the Royals and the Chiefs. Good morning. Happy Tuesday. It's great to be here on KCMO. And finally, we're going to get some answers here. A little more clarity is coming tomorrow as the Chiefs are set to debut their renderings of a reimagined Arrowhead Stadium. The big guns have been brought in because the Royals are not getting it done. Now, eventually, we had to find out what was going to go on at Arrowhead Stadium, how they were going to spend your tax dollars with a three-eighth cent sales tax extension if you vote yes on April 2nd. But it has been a tough PR campaign out of the gates for the Royals. A lot of people don't want to go downtown for a new stadium, which is where the Royals want to go in the crossroads. Uh, A lot of people are saying, where are we going to park in the wake of the KC current fiasco? More on that coming up in a couple of minutes. In the wake of the Super Bowl parade shooting, people have uh, concerns about safety in parts of Kansas City, Missouri. All legitimate beefs and legitimate issues. And then the overriding theme is in a county that has been fleeced by its bureaucrats at every turn. Do they want to shell out more money for billionaire owners? That's in large part what this conversation is going to come down to. So it's not been a good couple of weeks for the Royals, but the Chiefs, the Chiefs are back-to-back Super Bowl champs. The Chiefs have Patrick Mahomes. The Chiefs have Travis Kelsey. Don't worry, I'm not talking about Taylor Swift. Don't get triggered right now. The Chiefs have everything trending in the right direction for if there was ever a time to ask the taxpayer of Jackson County for more money. You can't get a better time than right now. And I don't know what the Chiefs are going to roll out here tomorrow, but they're going to have their renderings for a reimagined Arrowhead Stadium coming out sometime tomorrow in a big uh, press conference they're going to do. All I know is this. The timing could not be better, and they will likely drag the Royals across the finish line. I'll, I'll say this much. I hope that John Sherman has a nice gift basket set aside for Clark Hunt. Because if this thing does end up getting passed, it's in large part because Jackson County will not want to hurt the Chiefs. They'll want to give the Chiefs what they're asking for, which is the sales tax extension. And they're not going to want to screw with the Chiefs right now. And the Royals are going to benefit in a major way from that. The Royals, in part, may end up getting their downtown stadium simply because they have tied themselves to the hip on this ballot issue with the Kansas City Chiefs. And I just hope, and I'm sure that Clark Hunt will have his own suite in the new downtown stadium, but he deserves a couple of them, John, because he's going to be dragging Sherman across the finish line here. Well, that, and that's maybe the case right now, right? Yeah. 2015 when the Royals won the World Series and the Chiefs were kind of sniffing around the playoffs, beginning to, you know. might have been, She might have been on the other foot back then, just saying. Yeah, could right? have been. Sure. But, uh, but the, the play right now is just like you say. Yeah. Absolutely. Got to get this thing done mm-hmm. if you're uh, the Chiefs. And you got to drag the Royals across the finish line with you. So we'll be watching this thing. It's uh, still five weeks away from April 2nd, give or take. But voting is underway uh, for folks overseas in the military and whatnot. So literally one, two, three, five weeks from today is going to be voting day in Jackson County for the Chiefs and the Royals. Now, the Kansas City Current, the professional women's soccer team in town, they are still getting a ton of blowback over the parking fiasco they have created down there at the Riverfront Ballpark. So if you have not been following this story the last few days, uh, the current season is set to begin here in the next few weeks. Got this brand new stadium right there on the riverfront, due east of River Market, and... It's the first stadium that is built exclusively for women's soccer. And that's cool. I mean, that's great. I, I looked forward. I use that in past tense because I don't know if it's happening now. I looked forward to taking my girls to a game at some point. But then season ticket holders found out late last week 
that uh, parking was going to run you $68 per game after taxes and fees. That's because there's only a couple of spots. And and I say a couple, but there's like 2,000 spots, which is not enough for that stadium, which seats about 11,000. So they're jacking up the prices here for those who want to park, basically begging you not to drive to the game. They are begging you to go park somewhere else downtown, River Market, um, somewhere where you can take a bus. They are begging you to do everything. They're basically trying to price you out from being able to drive to a game. So local news has actually done a pretty good job being all over this. And, you know, knocking this entire situation is not being anti-current. It's not being anti-women's soccer. It's being anti-dumb business. And that's what this is, dumb business. So KCTV5 caught up with a couple of season ticket holders yesterday, and they talked to one guy who's not happy about the parking price and one lady who is accepting of the parking price. Take a listen to this. Tell people three weeks before you have to come up with a thousand dollars. Season ticket holder James Candiff isn't happy. He should have let everybody know initially what the parking situation was going to be like. He bought one seat for eight hundred and forty dollars only. By the way, who buys one seat as a season ticket? I'm, I'm just saying that's going to be impossible for him to sell. I mean, I'm just saying that's going to be a tough spot for the poor guy. Need to find out three weeks away from the first match that parking would cost him nearly the same. Had I known back when I purchased these season tickets in November of last year that it was going to cost me almost another thousand dollars and was able to make that informed decision, I probably would have made a different choice. It's a different story for season ticket holder Monica Massey. And when I became a season ticket holder, I expected to incur a cost outside of just the ticket. When you well, I, hold on there. With all due respect to that season ticket holder, she says, well, I expected to incur other costs when I became a season ticket holder. Yeah, of course. I mean, we we get that. Not $68 a game to park, Monica. What are you talking about? I mean, yes, of course you expect to incur other costs. $68 costing more to park at a current game than a Chiefs game? that, that, That is not a reasonable added cost as a season ticket holder. Yeah, I'm expecting to eat that Joe's Casey sandwich that they're going to have out there and the ice cream that they're going to have out there, not $68 for parking. (laughs) Exactly right. You expect to get fleeced a bit on the food, but not $68 for parking. Look at what other fans around the country pay to park to watch U.S. women's soccer. There's quite a difference. You only have to pay $10 to park at Lynn Family Stadium. Current has the first women's soccer stadium which Massey believes justifies the price to park. We want to be proud of the stadium. We want to be proud to showcase what we have here. And there's a cost that comes with that. No, 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 no. With all due respect, Monica, there is not a $68 parking cost that comes with having the first woman's soccer stadium. As someone who's about to have our third daughter, I think it's great to celebrate women's soccer and the first professional women's soccer stadium. To act like, well, $68 parking, just that's just part of the deal. No. KCTV5 had in its report that similar-sized soccer stadiums for women, even if they're not exclusively for women like Louisville, $10 parking. To act like this is just, well, part of doing business. No, it's not, John. It's dumb business. I'm with you. The this situation is like the deadpan comedian Stephen Wright's line. He says, "I used to work at a fire hydrant, a fire hydrant factory. You couldn't park anywhere near the place, <laughs> right?" <laughs> like, to, that was exactly my point. This is the first w- purpose-built women's professional stadium, and already it's got a, you know a black eye. Not a black eye, but you know what I'm saying. Uh, the downside is like. Yeah, you can't park anywhere near it. You can't park anywhere. So what kind of a jewel is that? It's not one right now. I'll tell you right now. If someone had given me tickets for one of the first couple of games with the girls, I would have gone. Right now, I'm going to wait to see how screwed up the situation is down there. I I am going to wait to find out and hear from you what the deal actually is trying to get in and out of a game. Rather than just going myself. So this is not about women's soccer. This is not about, well, cost of doing business. This is about horrible planning and an expectation that people are going to ride streetcars and walk a mile and, uh, you know, take buses to these games. And they're just not. 
They don't do it. They don't want to do it. And there's going to be a price that they're going to end up paying here. I'm wondering if everybody that pays the money is guaranteed a space. Because, you know, at Arrowhead, you pay, you go through the gate, and you park wherever you park. Yeah. Some people take up two spaces tailgating. I imagine they're going to not have anything like that. At Good point. These games, right? So yeah. There's no way you can take up two spaces or you're, you're in trouble. So if I'm paying my money, I want a space. Yeah. Right. That's a good point as well. You're going to have to close down some guy's tailgate to try to get a spot. You're going to end up getting into a fist fight in the parking lot so a guy moves his hamburgers and his grill. Uh, what the, who wants to be doing that? 913-408-7957. I, you know, listen, I, I want the current to be a success. I want the stadium to be a success. But the folks who planned it out did a horrible job, clearly. And the fact that they waited so long to tell people about the parking price – means that deep down, they know they screwed up. They're not getting caught off guard by this. That's why they waited until so close to the season to roll out this grand plan. Coming up on KCMO, um, Shawnee Mission North has an alum, one of the most famous folks in media, and the guy knocked it out of the park on a TV show yesterday. We'll play it for you next on KCMO Talk Radio 95.7 FM and stream us on the KCMO Talk Radio app. Shawnee Mission North's finest, Dr. Phil, knocked it out of the park yesterday. The guy went on The View. He's got this new book that he's pimping, and he's going all over TV to talk about it. By the way, is there any, like, statue of Dr. Phil at Shawnee Mission North or anything like that? Any acknowledgement do you guys know of Dr. Phil in or around Shawnee Mission North? Don't know. Not that I'm sure. Okay. My guess is he has a plaque somewhere, but I haven't seen it. All right. Well, if he doesn't, I'm going to start that. We're going to have our buddy who built us the uh, Kamala Harris quote plaque outside the studio. Now let's stop and think here because North was the Indians and now they are no longer the Indians, I oh. believe. So I'm not sure that Dr. Phil in turn would have a plaque. <laughs> You're right. right. As a cisgender white guy, he may not be high uh, on the list. Perhaps I'm overthinking it, but I'm just following logic. Yeah, well, especially now after what Dr. Phil said yesterday on The View, he went on The View once again to promote his new book. And he just laid in to the ladies on The View with straight fire and straight facts. Take a listen to this back and forth with um, The View hosts and how Dr. Phil just, I mean, shreds them. And the same agencies that knew that are the agencies that shut down the schools for two years. Who does that? Who takes away the support system for these children? Who takes them away and shuts it down? And by the way, when they shut it down, they stopped the mandated reporters from being able to see children that were being abused and sexually molested, and in fact sent them home and abandoned them to their abusers with no way to watch, and referrals dropped 50 to 60 percent. So, there was also a yeah. pandemic yeah, going was, on. They were trying to save kids' lives. They were trying lives, to save so kids' well. lives. Remember, we know a lot of folks who died. During this, so it wasn't people weren't laying Not around eating children. bond, but well, you know what? We're lucky. Maybe we're lucky they didn't because we kept them out of the 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 places that they could get, be sick because no one wanted to believe we had an issue. Are you saying no school children died of COVID? I'm saying it was the safest group. They were the less vulnerable group, and they suffered and will suffer more from the mismanagement of COVID than they will from the exposure to COVID. And that's not an opinion. That's a fact. Let's go, Dr. Phil. Woo! Woo! Man. Yeah, they took that plaque down yesterday. Yep, they <laughs> any, uh, any plaque that Dr. Phil might have had up was taken down by some woke bureaucrat who's still wearing seven masks from four years ago. Poor guy. Oh, man, that was beautiful. I mean, I... Gosh, I don't want to go back in time and talk about COVID right now, but I watched Dr. Phil last night of The View. That had me so fired up, John. I was like, Let, get me on the air. <laughs> Hold me back. Let's go. The View is lined up left to right across your screen. Behar picks up the flag, runs up the mountain, and plants it with moral superiority. <laughs> are you telling me no children die? Well, that's ridiculous. Yeah. Gosh, just, they are the worst. You're just running down to the far example. Exactly. No, no, he did not say that. He didn't say that. And he said, and as he laid out there beautifully, he said they were the least vulnerable group that will ultimately suffer the most. 
That is indisputable. And I love hearing Whoopi, no one wanted to believe we had an issue. Uh, No, I was doing this show. We were right here. I was sitting in this chair as COVID was unfolding. And it became evident fairly quickly that this was wildly dangerous and deadly for certain age groups and people who had certain backgrounds and certain health issues. But for those who were young and healthy, it was a cold. Okay, fine. It maybe was a bad cold. But to shut down an economy and shut down a school system because of that was not following the science, Dr. Fauci or Rex Archer or any of you other high and mighty slobs. Sorry. You know, recall in February of 2020, a couple of months before the big shutdowns, we talked about a student in Lawrence. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Uh, I think he had traveled international. Yeah. And and then they were hospitalized was kind of the first inkling of anything but from there it took a few months before the ripple effect yeah but, that's uh, right you know we were addressing it back then i remember that very well i remember having a conversation on this show in maybe february of 20 about whether or not you were still going to go eat chinese food because literally there were questions as to whether or not this was coming out of like chinese restaurants or something i mean it, it, just thinking back to that time is insane on so many levels and then of course the shutdown happens and the whole world goes absolutely nuts But for Dr. Phil to put the view, ladies, you know, Dr. Phil's not a political guy. He's just a doctor who happens to follow the science. For him to put them in their places like that, oh, my goodness. It felt so good to watch. I haven't had a moment like that where I watched a clip from daytime TV and started, like, pumping my fists and getting all excited. But that was awesome. Everything about that had me fired up for Dr. Phil. 913-408-7957. That's our studio line and our text line on a Tuesday morning on KCMO. Don't forget, tirade Tuesday. We do it every Tuesday at 835. If you are an early riser, know that you want to be back here in two hours because that's when we let this audience just have a field day and rip and blast whatever it is that you want to rip and blast. Locally, federally, worldwide, I don't care. You determine the content of this show Tuesday at 835. So don't miss it on 95.7 FM KCMO as we roll through uh, the 6 o'clock hour. It is so good to be here. Enjoy the 70-degree weather because you might get some snow flurries later tonight. (laughs) This is it. But we'll be back in the 70s coming up uh, this weekend. So next, if you are a um, homeowner anywhere in the metro, you probably have dealt with Or you know people who have dealt with Airbnb issues in neighborhoods. One local city passed an ordinance last night to try to do something about it. And I wonder if this is now a blueprint for other cities in the suburbs around Kansas City. We'll share with you what happened and what that will mean for Airbnbs coming up next on KCMO Talk Radio. Well, good on the city of Shawnee, but I don't think they went far enough. Last night, Shawnee's city council meeting took place. And uh, this has been an issue in Shawnee for quite some time, and that is Airbnbs, VRBOs, short-term rentals in the city. City council members say there are now around 60 in Shawnee. And what they did last night is they ended up putting some restrictions into place in in, in the city of Shawnee. They passed an ordinance outlining new rules for short-term rentals in the city, including requiring licenses, prohibiting the property from being used as a reception or party space, and requiring an agent or person managing the property to be within a 40-mile radius. Okay, that's good. That's great. I'll take it. If you're a Shawnee resident, you should be happy about this. But I don't think it goes far enough. I look at this and I understand there's this thought process of, hey, it's my property. Don't tell me what to do with it. I I get it. And I also understand that housing is getting more expensive. So there's a lot of people who have seen increases in their property taxes. Uh, They maybe have a little more home than they can afford. And they're trying to figure out how to lower their own costs. 
and they're either Airbnb, you know, portions of their home. Uh, they might be investors, Airbnb, entire homes. But if you're in a residential neighborhood and you're using your home as an Airbnb, that should be illegal. Because these homes are zoned R1, right? They're zoned for residential. They're not viewed at as hotels. They're not intended to be hotels. And that's effectively what you're turning homes into. So I, I, you know, there's always the arguments from the libertarian. And trust me, on a lot of issues, I, I agree. But you don't get to ruin neighborhoods by effectively taking your home and turning it into a hotel. You don't get to do it. If you were to do that in any other scenario, if you were like, hey, I'm going to knock down my house and and build a a two-story hotel, you'd have to go to a city council. You'd have to get that property likely rezoned. And they probably would say, no, you can't put a hotel in the middle of a residential neighborhood. You can't do that. We're not going to let you do that. And by the way, they would be right to say you can't do that. It is on planning commissions and, and, um, you know, cities around the metro have them and counties have them. To say, you know, we're going to put a hotel here, we'll allow restaurants here, we'll put a park there, we'll put neighborhoods here. I mean, that's kind of how a planning commission goes about its, its business. That's how it should go about its business. But this Airbnb issue is cropping up all over, not just Kansas City, but it's happening all over the country. Where investors, and this started during COVID when people got bored and they had a lot of cash and they were looking for things to do. They're like, oh, you know, I'll start buying up homes and turning them into Airbnbs. And it's like, well, what does that do to the neighborhood around you? Let's not forget it was a couple of years ago that there was a shooting and killing of a woman in Overland Park at an Airbnb rental home in March of 2022. And a Johnson County judge charged Anthony Dwayne Smith to 51 months in prison. So these things do not work out for the neighborhoods that they're in. If you want to go be an investor in, um, you know, some type of real estate, there's a lot of ways to do that. You don't get to corrupt neighborhoods. You don't get to screw over neighbors who are trying to raise families and live in peace and quiet. That's why they live there. So you can turn maybe a nice little profit on an Airbnb. Sorry, you just don't get to do it. So KCTV5 covered this yesterday. Um, in Shawnee, and and here's what ended up happening. I wouldn't say that every person who uses the facility, I have to call it a facility because it's not normally a house, they're not all a problem. But they're not all good either, and it has its moments. Monday afternoon, we spoke to Terry King. He's lived on Ballantyne Avenue in Shawnee for over 20 years. He says they've had problems with one home, which was turned into an Airbnb for several years. Major parties, there has been fights out front. You know, we've had some bad instances. I'll accept the motion on this. He joined his neighbors at tonight's city council meeting, and they weren't the only ones to speak out against them. It is not fun living through the issues that they create. One Airbnb owner says problems seem to be centered around a few short-term rentals in the city. We want regulation too. We don't want these bad Airbnbs out there. The council ended up passing an ordinance outlining new rules for short-term rentals, including requiring licenses, a property owner to live within a 40-mile radius, and bans on them being used as a reception or party space. Some residents, like King, feel like it's not enough. What they're offering is they're offering a way to help reduce our pain, but not eliminate the pain. By the way, can someone explain to me how you know for certain whether or not your Airbnb is going to be used as a party space? Because I could see a lot of situations where, you know, someone has an Airbnb in Shawnee. They rent it out to a group who decides to use it as a party space, ends up trashing the home, making noise all hours of the night. And what ends up happening? The owner of the Airbnb says, I didn't know there was going to be a party here. I... You know, it just got booked by somebody. What am I supposed to do? If the Shawnee City Council is not going to hold people accountable for that, if the Shawnee City Council is not going to be strong enough with a backbone to actually 
get those people in trouble, whether it's delist them on Airbnb or whatever it might be, um, then it's completely feckless and worthless. There's no teeth to this ordinance passed in Shawnee. And I know a lot of the folks, a couple of the people on the Shawnee City Council. And, and, you know, I'll just say this. We see the world the same way. They're really good. And I'm trying to get a couple or at least one of them on today to talk about this. They're good. And I know they're torn because they view this as saying, hey, this is America. It's your property. And that's true. It is. But to tie it back to my earlier example, you don't get to just build a hotel in a middle of a residential neighborhood. That would not be allowed. So why do we allow somebody or an investor to turn around and put an Airbnb up in a neighborhood and allow it to be a free-for-all? Why would we possibly allow that? And I'd like to see cities around the metro cracking down on this even more vigorously than what's happening right now. If you're in an HOA, by the way, you're, you're protected. In large part, you have HOA rules that probably prevent or can prevent, you know, you can pass your own as an HOA to prevent Airbnbs from being in your neighborhood. But folks who are not in HOAs, they're at the mercy of the city. And Shawnee doesn't necessarily have as many of those as, say, Overland Park or Olathe or other parts of the metro. So they need the city council to step up and stand up, by the way, stand up. For their homeowners, just like Shawnee has done when it comes to preventing or at least limiting big apartment complex bills. They've done a much better job than Lenexa, which is just, you know, I mean, any anyone who wants to build an apartment in Lenexa, they say, come on in. Olathe has been kind of embarrassing on that front as well. But Lenexa has been been the worst. So Shawnee's done a good job on that. In talking to people over there. But now they've also got to step up to the plate a little bit more and be a little more forceful when it comes to their Airbnb policy. This is a step in the right direction, but I don't think it's enough. 913-408-7957. That's our text line and our studio line here on KCMO Talk Radio, 95.7 FM. And, of course, 710 AM. Stream us on the KCMO uh, Talk Radio app. Two major food outlets have gotten a lot of blowback. One fast food joint and one all-American cereal have gotten enormous blowback the last 24 hours. We'll tell you why next on KCMO 95.7 FM. I don't know why everyone's ragging on the uh, Kellogg CEO. I think the guy's getting a raw deal here. Everyone's trashing this guy. Why? Well, uh, the Kellogg CEO, Gary Pilnick, Uh, Gary decided that he was going to suggest that people in these inflationary times when food's costing you a lot of money, you go to the grocery store, you walk out of there and you're like, that cost me what? Gary suggested that, you know, you turn the cereal. He said recently uh, in an ad, give chicken the night off. That's a new tagline from Kellogg's. Now they own Frosted Flakes, Fruit Loops, Corn Flakes, Raisin Bran and others. And um, he said recently in a statement that the cereal category has always been quite affordable. And it tends to be a great destination when consumers are under pressure. If you think about the cost of cereal for a family versus what they might otherwise do, that's going to be much more affordable. Hmm. Now, I, I, people are freaking out. Oh, he doesn't understand the plight of the little man. Well, no, uh, the government screwed us and created inflation. And the Kellogg CEO is saying, hey, we've got an alternative for you. If you want to eat cereal, it's a much cheaper option than eating chicken or steak or whatever it might be. It just might be something for you to consider. It's not his fault. It's not Gary Pilnick's fault that the government created an inflationary environment that skyrocketed your grocery bill. So don't be mad at him. Don't shoot the messenger in this case. You see what I'm saying, John? You on board with me here or not? I'm trying to work my way up to your point. Okay. <laughs> That's so, a nice way of saying it. Symbolically <laughs> speaking, we think of the CEO as maybe responsible for setting prices. Mm-hmm. Yes. But cereal is not immune to the other uh, inflation uh, factors, to your point. Yes. Because I would say, has he 
gone down the cereal aisle recently because that stuff's going up, especially oh. that brand. Well, is it really? Okay. Oh, yeah. I'm not a cereal uh, guy. Go the, uh, no, we already do that. Oh. You know? Uh, every once in a while, my wife and I was like, yeah, this, I don't want to cook anything. Cereal's easy. Milk or milk in a bowl, you know. Shredded now, what's wheat your cereal to go to there, well, it can John? Be shredded wheat. Okay. Something like that, or frosted shredded wheat. Okay. She All likes right. uh, oat flake things with strawberries. I'm not a fan of that. But <laughs> that's her dick. Anyway, <laughs> we, you kind of shop around the name brands even there. Well, okay. Yeah, so I don't know if Mark shops for cereal for his kids. Well, so I go down there and we look, and I'm like, yeah. But to your point, that's not necessarily his fault. Correct. Right. Cereal prices alone have increased 28% in four years. Okay. That's enormous. Mm-hmm. Now, um, in the last fiscal year, Kellogg raised its prices by 12%. So uh, they have certainly increased their prices. To your point there, John, mm-hmm. not all their own doing. Right. Cost of doing business has certainly gone up. Got to get it to the store in the truck, et cetera, et cetera. But still a cheaper alternative to other food mm-hmm. choices for uh, yeah, dinner yeah so i don't get offended when the kellogg ceo says hey if it's tight right now consider raisin bran because i'm like you know what not his fault we're living in these inflationary times i only buy cereal when it's on sale so. oh you're an on sale cereal oh, guy. yeah okay. i look for the sales and i'll get it if it's on sale now i wonder if shrinkflation is happening in cereal as well is the box mm-hmm. shrinking i got to imagine that's that's something that's on now, the table some of the store brands come in a bag so you can see Oh, do oh, bags. yeah. Gosh, yeah. yeah. So you know, I'm just not a cereal guy anymore. It's never I find been my cereal kind of like vegetables. It's like isn't it kind of all the same, <laughs> just different. You know what I mean? Green beans from Green Giant or from Always Choice or green yeah, beans. Yeah. All right. So Kellogg's is getting flack now. The other company that's getting some blowback here, Wendy's. What did Wendy's do? Wendy's is expected to roll out dynamic pricing similar to Uber's surge pricing as soon as next year. Their CEO announcing on an earnings call, beginning as early as 2025, Wendy's will begin testing a variety of enhanced features on these digital menu boards, like dynamic pricing, different offerings in certain parts of the day, AI-enabled menu changes, and suggestive selling based on factors such as weather. Now, I don't know how weather is going to impact what you're going to buy from Wendy's. You want some chili? <laughs> Subliminal messages over the speaker. That's you right. want some chili? Chili in the winter, frosty mm-hmm. in the summer. Sure. Maybe that's it. Yeah. I mean, what do you do when it rains? All right, give me the large fry. Screw the medium. I'm going large here. It's raining. I'm pissed. It's an AI menu. We used to pay a kid 10 bucks an hour to put it up there. <laughs> <laughs> so this has now got all people bent out of shape. Why? Because, well, you're going to pull up to a Wendy's potentially next year and not know, depending on the price of, you know, the time of day, how much your burger and fries are going to be. <laughs> the menus have like a Dow Jones crawl in the bottom <laughs> here, yeah, looking for the triple. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? Mm-hmm. So, like, that's cool. If you go to a Wendy's at like three in the afternoon and you know you're getting a deal because of the time of day, that's great. But if you go to Wendy's at 6 p.m. and you know that that, you know, burger that's normally six dollars is now seven fifty because of surge pricing. Are you going to go to Wendy's? I I think a lot of people are going to say, forget that. I'm not going to go during peak hours. They'll go find better deals. When I was a kid, we used to have to uh, put our schedule around the TV. You know, (laughs) Partridge family was on at seven. You had to be there. Right. Nowadays, it's like uh, we don't wash the dishes or laundry until after 8 because of the Evergy thing. So I might as well factor the drive through into my plans, too. It's like not going through the drive through between 5 p.m. and 7 p.m. So now you're going to be eating dinner at 9 o'clock. Yeah, Everyone's going to be sleeping. Four. Yeah, yeah, or 4, said the 60-year-old. Yeah, you'll be sleeping, you know, from uh, midnight mm-hmm. to 10 a.m. That way you can get the cheaper prices on breakfast <laughs> at 1030 in the morning. Uh, it's just, wow. Places are going to start to look like Black Friday where they used to line up outside the door. Yeah, just waiting for noon. That's right. Waiting for the prices to drop. So this is this is dangerous because here's the other thing for fast food. The other thing for fast food is that part of the model is you know that you go in there and you're going to get, you know, two burgers for $3 on certain days at certain times. Like that's part of the model. You know exactly what something is going to cost. And if Wendy's is going to go 
Uber pricing, where suddenly it'll surge up or down depending on time of day and demand. Could you imagine trying to explain to the old lady why her chicken nuggets are two dollars more than they were yesterday? <laughs> right. I mean, it's, I'm telling you, some poor schlep is not going to get paid enough to explain to grandma why her chicken nuggets are two dollars more than they were yesterday when she came at the exact same time. Well, ma'am, we've got more people at the drive-thru, and our artificial intelligence tells us <laughs> that we've got a higher demand, so your nuggies have gone up a couple of bucks. <laughs> Who wants to have that conversation with Grandma at Wendy's? Not me, and I imagine not many of you. So Godspeed to Wendy's, but I'll tell you right now, I'm sure it's going to be hard to hire people at Wendy's with that coming down the pike. That sounds awful. Not that I'm a regular Wendy's consumer or customer anyway, but I'll be staying far away. We do like the pawn shop where he makes an offer, I make an offer, and we <laughs> flip for it. Whoever wins is what you pay. Uh, 913-408-7957 as we approach uh, 7 o'clock on KCMO. Gen Z is living with parents at a higher rate than ever. I, I want to hear from parents who may be in that situation. The pros and cons next on KCMO. <laughs> Tuesday morning, it is great to be here on KCMO. Enjoy this final day of 70-degree weather. Tomorrow morning, it's going to be 20 at this time, so get used to it. Uh, But we will be back in the 70s by this weekend, so can't wait. Uh, We've got baby number three coming this weekend, so we are excited about that. And uh, expecting to be back, if all things go well, middle of next week. So you won't miss much of us, or at least much of me. John and Mark will be here. Holding down the fort on KCMO Talk Radio. So I think about this a lot. If you're a parent and you've got older kids right now, I imagine there are thousands of you dealing with this as we speak. Gen Z kids, maybe recently out of high school, not going to college. Maybe it's not their thing. That's fine. Trying to figure out what's next. Or kids out of college who are living at home. And I do want to hear from you at 913 408 7957 because there's a lot written about Gen Z that I think is unfair. And I say this as a millennial because every generation got some crap around this, right? Oh, the the youngest generation that's in the workforce is always the laziest. They don't get it. They don't want to do anything. They don't want to work. Well, no, I mean there's plenty of lazy boomers and Gen Xers. There's just plenty of lazy people. Millennials like laziness doesn't necessarily know an age. Hate to break it to you. Yeah, I kind of feel like in my life it's just permeated the whole country rather than a age group. Yeah, and I think it's getting worse, but it's getting worse across all age groups, I would say. Agree. You know, old, young, middle aged, everyone's just getting lazier. People don't want to work. It's like, hey, where's my vacation day? It's like, just just go to work, please. Not that you're not entitled to some time off, but just go to work for crying out loud. Um, So right now we find ourselves in a place where housing costs are astronomical. In 2022, Moody's reported the average American renter was spending more than 30% of their income on rent for the first time, a benchmark that the government considers rent burdened. So what's happening? Young people, in in particular, Gen Zers, are living at home. Now, you might think, and I'm not here to judge anybody, but I got to imagine that as a parent, A part of you is like, all right, I'm going to help Johnny get up on his feet. We're going to help him save some money. Not help him save money, but allow him to live at home and save some money. And then he's going to be off on his own. And then he's going to be able to, you know, afford rent and buy a house and the whole thing. But is that actually happening? In 2023, Bloomberg and a Harris Poll survey found 70% of 18 to 29-year-olds who live with their parents said they would not be in a strong financial position if they chose to live elsewhere. Now, right out of the gates, I'm sitting there and I'm saying, okay, if we are sending kids to college and they are coming out of college and they don't have a skill set that translates to a job that pays them enough money to then pay for their own rent, what are we doing? Why are we saying college is the answer, which it very much can be the answer. I'm not saying don't go to college. I mean, you know, I went, all of us went on the show. I'm simply saying if you're going to go to college and you're going to spend four years and tens of thousands of dollars at a place that does not prepare you 
to make money and have skill sets in the real world, then what are you doing? And yes, we can blame the colleges for that. But ultimately, as long as people are continued suckers and are going to continue to be suckers when it comes to this very issue and pay money to institutions that do not prepare you in any substantial way for the real world, then we have to take the blame as well. We have to force them to change through our behaviors. We have to force the colleges to say, gosh, maybe bringing these kids in here, making them woke with 17 different DEI courses, and then giving them no skill sets for the real world, maybe eventually that's going to backfire on us, so we should stop doing it. Just a thought, but that would be my initial As I look at that number, I say, okay, so kids are going to college, and I understand. I mean, there's a housing crunch, and the cost of housing has gone up, but now these kids are in a position where they can't even afford to live somewhere on their own after four years of college? Then what's the point of it? On top of that, um, when it comes to home ownership, that is similarly out of reach. While some Gen Zers have managed to sneak into the housing market, this is on businessinsider.com, by the way, the average age of first-time home buyers reached a record high 36 years old last year. More than one-third of Gen Z respondents in a recent survey said it's something they thought they'd never be able to achieve. So in the wake of the Great Recession, millennials were the first generation to stay home in mass, and now Gen Z is following in their footsteps. But unlike millennials, who were called lazy for living with their parents well into their 20s, it's become cool for Gen Z to live at home. In today's affordable housing crunch, older generations are starting to understand that it often just makes sense to stay home and save up. But that decision comes with downsides. Living on your own is an important step in becoming an adult, writes Business Insider. And research indicates, this is the kicker, research indicates those who put off leaving the nest are going to pay financially and emotionally. Here are some of the numbers. And, and this is not something I would have ever expected. A recent report from the Urban Institute found that those who lived with their parents between the ages of 25 and 34 were significantly less likely to be homeowners 10 years later. Once again, those who lived with their parents between the ages of 25 and 34 under the guise of Live at home, Johnny. Save money. Then you can go buy a home. They were less likely to be homeowners 10 years later than those who were not living at home. What does that tell you? What it tells me is that coddling does not work. Coddling only enhances whatever, uh, you know, shortcomings individuals may have. Treating a 28-year-old grown man like he's eight and keeping him in the nest, and let's be honest, and I know this, all right, uh, there are some of you that don't want the kids to leave the nest. That's okay. Mm -hmm. But you're not doing your kid any favors. You're failing your child. The notion that, well, they're going to live at home and mommy's going to, you know, do their laundry and uh, cook them dinner and they're going to save up and they're going to go on their own and they're going to fly out of the coop. No, they're not. They're, they're going to get comfortable. They're going to get lazy. Mm-hmm. They're never going to adult. They're not going to date. They're going to be single forever. And um, we're not doing them the favor that we think we're doing as parents, John. Well, yeah, I think in that age group at 25 to 34, man, you get set in your ways. It's uh, it, There are different issues here, but I know like my friends who stay single, once you get to a certain age, you're used to your life as a single person. It becomes harder to think about integrating someone else into the system because you're comfortable, I guess. That's well, what you know, that's one thing. That is so true. Uh, I've got a buddy of mine who's uh, probably early 40s now here in town, and he's single, and he goes, it gets harder to date. Yeah. Because I've just got my routines. Now, back to the front end of that, when, I'm, when we were quoting 25 to 34 roughly there, it was my son wanted to get out, and I'm like, are you sure you want to go? You know, yeah. I'm not kicking you out of the house. So it wasn't that I wanted him to go, but bless him, he wanted to go. Right? Well, and he stayed out, and he did it. But to the point I was going to make, what I did, I wanted out. 
Yeah. At 21, when I got home from college, like, I don't want to live at home. So within months, I had two other buddies. We had a place. Kids today don't even interact with each other to even find two buddies to go live with. That is such a great point. That is such a great point. You know, I mean, they'll literally sit on the couch next to each other and text each other. (laughs) (laughs) And I say this, I'm saying this as a millennial. I sound like an old man as I sit here, but you're right. I mean, it feels like that is not even an option anymore. Hey, a couple guys come together. Hey, we're Mm going to all live together for a little bit and uh, life's going to be good. One one guy's got a girlfriend. He's moving out. Oh, crap. We got to find somebody else, et cetera. We got to get a replacement. We all need to go somewhere else. Yes. 15 years ago, that's exactly what I was like. Me and five buddies moved into the house together. Five. 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 All right. Oh, boy. That was a frat house, wasn't it, Mark? Four bedroom house and a basement. So Uh, uh, we each had our own space. Who Mm -hmm. drew the short straw in the basement? Uh, Or actually, that might have been the best straw. Oh, it that wasn't was bad. The winner yeah. flipped the coin. I'll take the basement. Nine one three four zero eight seven ninety five seven. Especially if you're a parent right now, and I get it, you got kids, you're trying to help them out. But what is that fine line between saying, "Hey, I'm here to help," but also I'm not going to enable you to hang out in the house till you're thirty years old and doing your laundry? That's unacceptable. Nine one three four zero eight seven ninety five seven. As we roll through the seven o'clock hour. On KCMO Talk Radio. And did you see uh, who Trump wants to deport? This is actually a very unifying message from Donald Trump. We'll tell you about it coming up. This may be the most unifying thing Donald Trump has ever said since he became a politician. Good morning on a Tuesday. It's great to be here on KCMO. Charlie Gasparino, Fox Business, will be here just after 8 o'clock today. Donald Trump telling the Daily Express, a U.K. publication... That um, he's not a fan of Prince Harry, the Duke of Sussex. And he very clearly said that Harry's immigration status might come under scrutiny. Donnie telling this publication, the Daily Express out of the UK, quote, I would not protect him. He betrayed the queen. She's a real beauty. That's unforgivable. He would be on his own. If it was down to me. God save the queen, man. Man, you know what? I, I'm telling you, if Donald Trump runs on a platform of shipping Prince Harry out of the country and sending Meghan Markle packing with him, I, that'll be the most unifying message Don has had since he came down the escalator in 2015. I would love everything about it. You could probably get 70% of Americans, might be 80. I don't know. Maybe I'm living in my own bubble here. But who honestly likes Harry and Meghan? I, I, I don't know. I've never met somebody who's like, you know, Meghan and Harry, they just really connect with me. They are the definition of elitist, whiny snobs. Their podcast totally bombed. Who paid them for that? Was it Spotify who paid them for the podcast? I mean, whoever it was, why you would pay a guy whose only interesting aspect is that he happened to be born in to the royal family. Why you would pay him for a podcast is beyond me. And, I mean, she's a pretty face, I'll give her that much, but she's never been a compelling figure of any kind, John. So I think Don's on to something here. Was it a a Netflix series or something? They did a Netflix series, too, and a podcast. Yes, they had both. Mm -hmm. So Don finished the sentiment by slamming Biden... (laughs) For what he characterizes as going easy on Harry as it pertains to the DHS controversy. He said, I think they have been too gracious to him after what he has done. So what Trump's alluding to here is the Department of Homeland Security battle that Prince Harry is currently involved with, which is a watchdog group suing the federal government in an attempt to obtain documents from Harry's immigration papers and application for his visa. The guy's not a U.S. citizen. And by the way, last year he confessed in his memoir that he had done a number of drugs before coming on over to the States. I mean, he's a bum. He's a bum. I don't know what else to say about him. I mean, you know, we knock other people who are coming over the border and mooching off the country. What's Prince Harry doing? Collecting checks for being Prince Harry. So uh, good on Don. I think this would be a wildly unifying message. You know, don't get me wrong. Trump can be controversial. But if he uh, runs his campaign in part on giving Prince Harry the boot or at least not cutting him slack when it comes to his immigration status, uh, send him on the first uh, boat out of town. I'd be down with that. 
Now, today is the uh, Michigan primary. And Trump is going to steamroll Nikki Haley in Michigan. It's not going to be close. It might be 70-30, 75-25. It's not going to be close. I thought about, and I was talking to somebody up in Detroit yesterday about bringing on a guest to talk about Michigan. And then we both came to the conclusion of why. Like, there's, there's nothing more to say beyond Donald Trump winning in Michigan today, going in the Super Tuesday, winning Every state on Super Tuesday, the question is really, by what margin? That's it. But what will be interesting after South Carolina on Saturday, which Trump won 60-40, and that was Nikki Haley's home state, but how does he do in some of the more suburban districts, especially in a place like Michigan, that I'm not saying he needs to win Michigan, but it certainly would help him in a big way if he was able to take down Michigan as he did back in 2016, but then did not in 2020. If he performs well amongst Republicans in um, college-educated counties in the Detroit suburbs, that's a good sign for him. That's a sign that, you know, as as we move from 2020 to 2024, people are looking back and saying, you know, yeah, the guy was a knucklehead at times, but gosh, economy was a lot better, country was a lot safer, border was in better shape, Foreign policy was not the nightmare that it is right now. Uh, Yeah, you know, I didn't like all the mean tweet stuff, but, you know, there was a lot that worked for this country and worked for me. That's the only thing that we can learn out of today. It's not about who wins. We know who's going to win. It's about what is the strength in the suburbs outside of Detroit that you look at and you say that's where Trump is going to be able to potentially gain some ground, hopefully outperform. And put himself in a position that as we look ahead to the fall, which is really what matters here, he's got a chance to beat Joe Biden or at least keep it close with Joe Biden in some of these districts and counties. And then that allows him to run up some numbers out state and try to flip the state of Michigan back into his column, which he won in 2016, but then lost in 2020. That's going to be the big question coming out of tonight. And then hopefully, you know, he runs a big ad campaign about deporting Prince Harry. And, you know, he can really rally a lot of Americans and bring us all together, which we desperately need right now. A Kansas City radio legend called it quits yesterday, announcing his retirement. He's not off the air necessarily. He just announced uh, that his retirement is going to be coming at some point in the near future. And it's someone that, you know, I've had the opportunity to Worked down the hall from here over the last several years since I got to town. As we get to start year seven of this show coming up in just a few weeks, uh, our good friend Slacker at 101 The Fox, who has been courageously battling cancer, made an announcement yesterday afternoon on 101 The Fox uh, that he would be retiring. And here's part of what his retirement statement sounded like yesterday. Uh, I wanted to share with you guys something that I... um have with a heavy heart to share the fact is all weekend long i've been going back and forth not only with my family but um you know in prayer and and with my doctors to decide that it's time for me to announce my retirement and it doesn't come easy and there's no end date to this but the fact remains that i'm still in a battle with cancer and in order to do my best I'm going to have to dedicate my myself at some point to that mission. And man, I, honestly, those of you who are listening this afternoon who, who've ever contemplated uh, retirement, you know what kind of struggle it is because I don't ever, I never thought of myself as retiring. I, I figured that I would be the guy that would uh, continue to be on the radio forever. And it would be my fervent wish to do that. Uh, I don't think my body is going to allow me to do that. But man... I want to spend the remains of my time in celebration of a career that has been and has given me so much. Slacker on 101 The Fox, uh, part of his retirement announcement yesterday afternoon. Um, Someone who has been down the hall from us uh, since I got here. And, you know, John, I imagine you and Slacker go back a very long time. Do you not? You know, I didn't work with him until we worked here at this company. 
But I've met him and been around him quite a bit. You know, Slacker mm-hmm. doesn't know any strangers. <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> you know, it, we, we obviously bump into each other every morning before our shows, in the hallways. And uh, he was always the guy uh, and is always the guy who is the first one to kind of get you in the mood, mm-hmm. you know, to do your morning show. And that's what I always appreciated. There would be days, you know, where I'm kind of in my tunnel vision zone thinking about four hours of talk radio. I got to go from point A to point B. Who are we talking to? When it's happening? Does Mark have all the sound bites we need? And my mind is racing in 15 different directions. And I'd be in the break room at like 545 in the morning. And he'd just come in and start screaming something nonsensical that really had nothing to do with anything. (laughs) But it was funny. And it allowed me to kind of reset myself and reset my brain and say, hey, we're not curing cancer here. Go have fun these next four hours and try to make people laugh a little bit. Talk about the news. Talk about what's going on. But don't take yourself too seriously. And that's what he always brought to the table with great professionalism as well. And that's a tough balance, you know, especially when you're trying to be that funny, goofy guy like uh, many folks in music radio want to be. But to balance it with the professionalism and the authority that he has on air is very unique, John. He would, uh, you know, in the morning, you'd say, you just pass in the hall, right? Yeah. You know, hey, Slacker, what's up? My weight? Yeah. (laughs) The rent? The rent. (laughs) (laughs) You know, know, he'd literally answer your question. He literally would answer that question. The the weight, you know, we'd be standing at the urinal. And Mm -hmm. I I stopped asking him what's up because he would just say, my weight, my you know, weight hey, my weight, mm-hmm. every single time. So I'm like, I'm sick yeah. about how he, this guy's getting it. fatter mm-hmm. by the week. So I, I, I would just say, hey, man, what's up? How are you, slacker? You know, that was always my thing. I just I just stopped asking him what's up because I knew what yeah. his answer was going to be. Yeah, you got to ask him something else. Yeah. <laughs> my first uh, radio remote that I ever did in 2007. Is that right? Worked at the old... Uh, you know, the other company across the street. But. Yeah. Oh, uh, Soros Radio? Yeah, Soros Radio now. That's what I'm going to start calling Odyssey. <laughs> they're, they're George Soros Radio. I think he bought like $400 million in their debt. So you can just call him. If you're talking about, you know, one of the other radio groups in town, just call him Soros Radio. So when I worked at Soros Radio in 2007, uh, first time I drove the van out to the remote, it was uh, Monday Night Football. Come watch it with Slacker at the Hurricane. Then it was called the Riot Room. And then, you know, an ambulance ran into it or whatever. But anyway... <laughs> Uh, yeah, that was uh, that was a good time. Slacker's advice to me was always, no, no matter who's here or what's going on, just take the free beer. Yeah, that's that is such great, and that is such slacker advice, isn't it? Take the the good Irishman, um, take the free beer, and um, those are great words. That's a great bit of advice. Although, Mark, you don't even drink beer, so you never took his advice. I know. I told him I can't take it here. I can't take your advice here because I have to drive the van back. Yeah, but Mark, I, I don't think I've ever seen you drink a single beer. Would you start taking some advice from Slacker? I'll take a free beer every now and then. Uh, I will. Yeah, yeah, and thanks yeah, to Slacker. You'd rather have free money in your uh, DraftKings account, though. I know that much. That's true. Oh. I remember Slacker's morning demeanor, right? Brother? <laughs> you know, if he hadn't had his coffee yet, he was... Kind of a low keel, but I could make his day because I would remember to pick up a packet of Cholula <laughs> at Quick Trip <laughs> because he'd be he'd be the first guy in the building in the morning, maybe I'm the second yes, guy. Yes, you and guys there, were there one would and be two. a desperate day. He'd be like, "Dude, you got any hot sauce? I got this burrito. <laughs> Come on down, Slack. <laughs> Come, a couple packets of Cholula. You were always there to bail him Otherwise, out. Otherwise, yeah, I guarantee you, there's a bottle down there in the break room with his name on it. Oh, that's awesome! Look at you helping out the uh, cumulus family here, you John learn, Anthony. Yeah, to do what you can when you can. Well, a little this, bit here and there. Well, Slacker, you know, um, he has not been doing his show from here, so we have not seen him in a while as he's been battling uh, this cancer. So uh, I talked to him briefly yesterday. I wanted to offer him to come on this show and just talk a little bit about what he's been going through, his battle with cancer, um, his faith, which has been huge for him during this journey. I know if you follow him on social media, you've seen him talk a lot about that. And just in large part, you know, what Kansas City Radio means to him and what he's been through. Um, it is a fraternity in many ways, and I mean that, of course, cross sexes, fraternity for men and women in mm-hmm. this business, in this town. And Slacker has certainly been uh, at the epicenter of that for a very long time during what is now, I didn't realize, 16 years I heard him mention now on 101 The Fox. So he's not done, but you did hear Slacker announce 
that he is uh, retiring from radio at some point in the not too distant future and basically there's going to be a day when he says today or tomorrow is my last day and for a guy who has you know really taught me a lot just about life through random hallway conversations <laughs> we are praying for him and we are wishing him nothing but the best john got my packets of chulula handy yeah and john's always got that on on hand for our buddy slacker so say a prayer for him as um you head out the office this morning and get ready for work and we will be pulling for him and praying for him as well here on KCMO Talk Radio. It was really nice what Joe Biden said about Lake and Riley. It really, uh, the, she was the 22 year old nursing student who was uh, found dead on the wooded trail at the University of Georgia when a 26 year old illegal immigrant from Venezuela, Jose Antonio Ibarra, who was charged on Friday with the kidnapping and murder of Lake and Riley. Uh, committed the heinous act that he allegedly committed late last week. And uh, Joe Biden spoke about it over the weekend. Here's what he had to say, just in case you missed it here on a Tuesday morning. Jill and I know the deep hole in your hearts when you bury a piece of your soul deep in this earth. We know. We know you will never feel the same again. I've watched with awe as you summon the absolute courage to channel God's grace. You're so brave. Why does justice not roll like a river or righteousness like a mighty stream? Why? Why? To everything there is a time and a purpose and a season under the heavens. May God be with you, George Floyd, and your family. Oh, crap. Uh, that was sorry. No, that was just Joe Biden's tribute to George Floyd. He hasn't said a damn word about Lake and Riley. He couldn't even pronounce her name. He was too busy eating ice cream yesterday talking about ceasefires in Gaza. So my bad. Uh, We had the wrong audio clip. And then Mark informed me that there actually is no audio clip of Joe Biden doing a tribute to Lake and Riley, who was murdered by an illegal immigrant on a running trail. No one's going to be kneeling for Lake and Riley in Congress No one's going to be burning down police precincts on behalf of Lake and Riley. Uh, There's not going to be, you know, millions marching in the streets on behalf of Lake and Riley. They'll do it for an eight-time convicted criminal who served prison sentences. Uh, But, you know, Lake and Riley, innocent students going out for a run. Nah. Not worth the president's time. Just to kind of compare those two things it really is when you think back to that time truly stunning because one person was being used for political purposes by an entire political party they don't have any use for lake and riley in fact it really highlights the failures of soft on crime policies from the federal level all the way down to the local level You have a guy who crossed the El Paso region of Texas in September of 22, was sent to New York, was, by the way, arrested in New York for endangering a child. Then he takes himself down to Georgia where he commits petty crimes and ends up uh, getting arrested. The prosecutor down there slaps him on the wrist. He then ends up driving for Uber and DoorDash, getting around E-Verify, using his brother's information somehow. And then he ends up committing this heinous crime. This story from start to finish is about federal policy that is soft on crime to local policy that is soft on crime and the failures of soft on crime policies. Every single step of the way. That's what this story is. And anyone with common sense, like, should be able to look at this and say, wow, maybe we should do a better job figuring out who's coming across the border. It's not anti-immigrant to say that. It's anti-illegal immigration to say that. It's not anti-immigrant to say that. But that doesn't stop, you know, the New York Times from putting this piece out yesterday titled Arrest of Migrant in Georgia Killing Turned City into Latest Battleground on Immigration. This does not to be, it doesn't need to be about a battleground. 
there's no battleground to be had here. It's just, do you have common sense or do you not have common sense? Do you think that we should have policies along the southern border that don't allow eight and a half million people to, by the way, cut the line in front of those who are actually trying to come into the country the right way, many of whom we can't keep track of, many of whom we don't know who they are, many of whom end up using government services that then in turn can't be used by our own citizens. Government services needed by poor Americans, poor Kansasidians, that then cannot be used by our people because they're being used by people who, you know, are here illegally. And you can have sympathy for those individuals. You can have empathy for anyone who's trying to better their lot in life. But at the expense of our own people? That's what I always find so hypocritical about so many who put their signs out in their front yard saying, in this house, we believe no human's illegal, right? First off, open your back door then. And part two of that is you claim you care about the poor and you want more government services for the poor. But when American poor people are getting hosed because those services have to be rerouted elsewhere, who really gets hurt? The same people you claim you're out here to help. So I'm not going to hold my breath for uh, Joe to give some nice soliloquy like he did for St. George. My man at a Shawnee Mission North. Let's raise a glass this morning to Dr. Phil. That's right. I never thought I'd be saying that today, but here we are. Dr. Phil laid in, figuratively speaking, to the ladies on The View yesterday. He gave them the business. Dr. Phil has got a new book that he's uh, out there pimping, and, you know, uh, it might be worth reading. I'm going to check it out now. I wonder if the ladies had, like, Apple watches, and they all start spiking on their blood pressure <laughs> when he was talking. You hear all these alarms going off. <laughs> yeah, their heartbeat starts picking up. <laughs> oh, man. So he goes on The View yesterday. He just, oh, man, demolishes uh, the whole crew there. And he's referring back to something from three to four years ago during COVID, talking about kids and what's gone on with our children and the learning loss, the potential generational loss that we suffered through. And he just gave them the business. And the same agencies that knew that are the agencies that shut down the schools for two years. Who does that? Who takes away the support system for these children? Who takes them away and shuts it down? And by the way, when they shut it down, they stopped the mandated reporters from being able to see children that were being abused and sexually molested and, in fact, sent them home and abandoned them to their abusers with no way to watch. And referrals dropped 50 to 60 percent. So there was also a yeah. pandemic yeah, going was, on. They were trying to save kids' lives. They were trying lives. to save so kids' well. lives. Remember, we know a lot of folks who died during this. So it wasn't people weren't laying Not around eating bond. But, well, you know what? We're lucky. Maybe we're lucky they didn't because we kept them out of the 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 places that they could be sick because no one wanted to believe we had an issue. Are you saying no school children died of COVID? I'm saying it was the safest group. They were the less vulnerable group and they suffered and will suffer more from the mismanagement of COVID than they will from the exposure to COVID. And that's not an opinion, that's a fact. By the way, the view crowd is cheering. The crowd on the view, which, you know, let's be honest. If you're schlepping yourself into Manhattan on a Monday morning to go watch The View, I'm pretty confident we got an idea of where you're at. And they're cheering on Dr. Phil. That was maybe the craziest part of the whole clip. Not that Whoopi Goldberg's like, people died. Yeah, we know. But have a nuanced conversation about it. Get your head out of the gutter. We knew pretty quickly that kids were far less vulnerable and that the loss for children, the social loss, the learning loss, um, you know, how many kids that didn't have parents that were able to watch over them were doing God knows what, have set themselves back for an entire lifetime. They were at the least risk. That's a fact. And that's what Dr. Phil's pointing out there. And, the you know, take the moral high ground like Whoopi Goldberg and the whole staff. Well, oh, but you're telling me? No, he's telling you facts. 
indisputable facts. And that what we did to the kids lasted way too long. And the crowd cheering was, that was a nice little bonus as well. So Dr. Phil did that on The View last night, and then he went on uh, Fox last night, and he expanded a little bit further. So can we get a GoFundMe for Dr. Phil's statue outside of Shawnee Mission North, where (laughs) he played linebacker, by the way? Uh, We got to get some love. I don't know if the Shawnee Mission bureaucracy is going to like that all that much. I'm sure they won't. They would probably just deface it and, you know, try to tear it down. But um, I say we make a push for it. We'll fund it. We'll crowd fund for it and crowdsource and do all that stuff and go fund me and have a blast. Anyway, here we was on Fox News last night expanding on this. The fact of the matter is that we had a, 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 a pandemic here. Children were not very vulnerable to that. Now, we, we want to protect everyone, right? Uh, but children were not very vulnerable to that. But what they were vulnerable to was disrupting their lives. We know that the we had the highest levels of anxiety, depression, and loneliness, as well as suicidal ideation and suicidal attempts, than that in 08 and 09 that we've seen since they started keeping records. That just continued to build, and then COVID hit, which caused it to spike. COVID didn't cause it. It started back in 08 and 09, and it kind of correlated with the smartphone dropping, where kids stopped living their own lives and started watching others live their lives. But they knew that when they shut the schools down. You pull out the support system, and as well as pulling out the support system, you disrupt, when you pull out the support system, you disrupt their educational development, their social development, right. their emotional development, and you also take children that have been subject to emotional abuse and sexual molestation, and you take them away from the mandated reporters who can keep an eye on them, and referrals to Department of Child and Family Services dropped 40, 50, 60 percent across the nation. What did we do? We sent them home and locked them up with their abusers Mm -hmm. so nobody could watch them. And what what did they say when they shut the schools down? They said, well, you know, we're doing the best we can with what we know. No, you're not. You knew better, and you knew it at the time, and you didn't have a plan to reopen those schools, and now those kids are suffering. Will they ever close the gap? Who knows? You Pediatric to- epidemiologists say it could cost millions of years of life lost for, these, for this yeah, generation. Yeah, I, I don't think... Absolutely. Dr. Phil, baby! What a beautiful, beautiful commentary from him between The View and then expanding on that on Fox last night. Just nailed it as he's promoting his new book all over TV. On the text line, Pete, Dr. Phil is still a big wokey. He wouldn't go on The View if he wasn't woke. Oh, stop. Are you kidding me? The guy went on The View and and just gave the business to those five wackos. Is it five or six? Whatever. It's five or six too many. He gave them the business with facts. You think that that makes him woke? These are the same people that complain because I have Quentin Lucas on every week. Oh, I don't want to hear him anymore. He's a piece of hack. He's a commie. I, this is what we need more of. We need more of people like Dr. Phil going on The View and explaining facts and science. We need more of that. Not criticizing. Do- How dare he go on The No. If they invited me on The View tomorrow, not that they ever would, but if they invited me on The View tomorrow, <laughs> I'd be running to New York. I'd take a train. I'd take – Mayor Pete could put me on his favorite choo-choo train, and I'd take it there. I'd save him the carbon emissions going on a plane. That's how, that's how fired up I'd be to go do it. Come on. This is what we want more of, not criticizing Dr. Phil for doing the show. No. We should be praising him for doing the show and anybody else who wants to go do that show with a different worldview than what you hear on that show on a regular basis for the seven people that still watch it.